Easter Friday morning, an Ireland may look pretty small on a satellite picture. But when you pack 550 miles of special stages and tarmac roads that have been closed to the public into five days of rallying, it is truly a marathon event for man and machine. The 51st circuit has attracted the best in the world, and among them, Per Eklund, one of the 109 entries. But the big question is whether it will be three in a row for Jimmy McRae or victory for four-wheel drive. Jimmy, do you think by Tuesday you'll be sharing the circuit hat-trick record with Roger Clark? Certainly hope so. You know, we're here to try that and uh, we'll do our best this weekend. You must be worried by the Quattro. A bit worried, especially in this weather, because I think uh, you know it's a benefit for four-wheel drive when it's so wet and slippy. <laughs> the Quattro is going to be a big challenge to you this weekend? Well, the sticker on their car says that Fords are fast but Quattro's are faster, so, so maybe that's the case. You and Hanu have been from the same town, you must be old rivals. Well, we are rivals but still outside of uh, rally we are good friends, so rivalry only applies to competition. Although Ari's MCD Escort is brand new, the rear-wheel drive RS 1800 is almost obsolete in tarmac rally. But definitely not so, the Quattro. This partnership of you and the Quattro are favourites for the World Championship. How do you feel your chances stand in the circuit? Oh, I think it's uh, quite good chances. Uh, only, only thing which is lacking is my experience on this island. I haven't been uh, doing circuit of island uh, more than once, and uh, that was very short visit that time. So I haven't seen these roads before. And you have 550 miles of tarmac stages ahead of you. Do you think the Quattro four-wheel drive advantage will be so great on tarmac? No, it's uh, not so so big because uh, more slippery it is. Uh, better Quattro is and of course asphalt uh, is uh, you have very good grip so we haven't uh, got that kind of advantage but I think it will go well Fastest time on the first stage, Henry Tyvenen looks apprehensive. about his breakfast at the Europa. Per, if I can ask you to change languages just for a moment. Yes. The world rally debut of the Toyota Celica, the lighter, more powerful Celica. Are you going to improve on last year's sixth place in the circuit? Uh, I try, yes. <laughs> it's a long way to finish. Long way to go. Last year you had some tyre problems for most of the event. Yes. Are you happier with that situation now? As we use Michelin, now we see what this like. I think is good. Jer, last few performances in the circuit for you. You've had fourth, you've had third, you've had second. What will it be this year? Hopefully first, but uh, it won't be a very easy task. And you got Rockstar, I would say, this year, uh, Hanno Mikula, 
Ari Vatnan, uh, Jimmy McRae, there's many others, Billy Coleman, many others as well. It's going to be very, very difficult to uh, compete with those people. Very happy with the car. I'm in the Vauxhall Chevette. It's a super tarmac rally car. We went down to the West Cork International three weeks ago and won that one, so it gives me a lot of confidence and uh, I think things are going very well. Terry Cabey in another works prepared Vauxhall. But it's Austin McHale's private entry that we see first on stage four. Another top privateer, Robert Moffat. There was only one little dry spot in Tully Lube, and by now the Quattro was already in trouble, having broken one of its four drive shafts. The two Rothmans Opals were in the lead, with Jimmy a mere ten seconds ahead of Toivonen. World champion Harry Vatanen was fifth. And he was just three seconds ahead of a stuttering Pear Eklund. It takes more than a deluge to dampen Irish enthusiasm, or indeed Russell Brooks in his immaculate HSR. Desi McCartney in his Chevette was well at home in these conditions. He takes the high road. Austin McHale, however, trying even harder in his Vauxhall, very nearly decides on the low road. Immaculate no more. Russell had stuffed the front into the ditch and lost a minute, but the Midlands driver is good at overcoming such adversities. Meanwhile, among the later runners, Joss Way had almost made Prospect Hill a no-way. The 1600 Sunbeam Talbot had ground to a halt in a most awkward place. David Flood is due next, and he just about squeezes past the stricken Sunbeam. Meanwhile, they're trying to spend uh, three, or possibly four, cylinders to work. And here comes Robert Mahari. By now, the time for the Gloucestershire crew is beginning to run out, but eventually they get the Sunbeam to struggle off the stage. Further down the same stage, Ian Harrison was having no problems. And Scotsman, John Stewart, was enjoying himself thoroughly in his Escort Mexico. A brief glimpse of David McElroy and his two-litre Sunbeam, but back amongst the professionals, Hanno Mikola's drive shaft has been quickly replaced by the Sutton team, and he and Arnie Hertz are still inside the top ten. Despite their problems, the Audi has been fastest on four of the first ten stages, and nobody is underestimating the potential of the German supercar. Taking full advantage of the Audi's initial setback, the Opals have been flying at the head of the field. But Jimmy McRae also has problems at this stage, and he gets a puncture further down this road. This will put Toivonen in the lead for a short spell. Ari Vatanen is up to third place and showing true world championship style. Toivonen's terrific. And he doesn't know at this moment that he is actually the new leader.
heighten strange sounds of rallying in the future. Mikula is second fastest to Toivonen on this stage. But One Works Challenge has disappeared in a haze of expensive smoke. And this is the last time we will see Per Eklund and the new Celica. By stage 14, Jimmy McRae was back in the lead. Toivon in second, Vatten in third, KB fourth, and Mikula in the Quattro had worked his way back up into fifth position. But Northern Ireland drivers expected to do well in their own home territory weren't having such a good day. Desi McCartney was plagued by a misfire and John Lyons had been off the road for a minute two stages previously. John Price is priceless in the Renault 5 Turbo. But Rosie Smith prefers the more ladylike approach. This service crew is a bit short of passenger accommodation, but if he stays up there, he'll get a good view of the Knox Brothers' antics. As the lower seeds, including John Flood, head back for Belfast to complete the 14 stages of the Friday run, which was sponsored by the Belfast City Council, one enthusiast is reluctantly dragged back away from the action. It's been a good day for the Rothmans Opal. Jimmy leads and Henry is quite happy to let him do so. Ari is well in touch in third place in the escort and Terry Cavey the top Vauxhall in fourth place. Hanno has brought the Quattro back up to fifth and John Coyne is the top Irishman in his sunbeam. Day two, and it's a different story for Toivonen. You seem to have a bit of a sore arm there. What happened? I can't remember. What was the stage number? My foot slipped from the brake pedal and uh, we hit a uh, stone wall. And uh, it was quite bad to crash and I uh, hit my hand to the steering wheel. And now there is... This bone is broken and also this one. You have two broken bones in the hand. It, it seems very swollen. It must be very painful. It is, yeah. Well, I have eaten all the time these pills, what the doctors give, so it's not so bad. You're taking, pa you're taking painkillers? Yeah, yeah. But still, you know, I can't drive very well with the right hand. And it's these stomach stages, they are quite hard for one, one hand. Do you, do you think that you may be able to keep, keep going to the finish? Well, I have a doctor in Kil Killarney? Killarney, and uh, he will say if I can continue or not. Very, very hard luck. Uh, you were going very well. We, we, you were tipped to win this event after yesterday's startling performance. Oh, well, you know, it's, it's rolling. That's rolling, yeah. You look like a man with the, the pressure taken off now. I wouldn't say that because uh, Ari Vatten is behind us now and he's going very quick. So there's no, there's no time to relax. It's a very difficult task, just as difficult as it was two years ago to try to stay ahead of him. Watch this for a one-handed performance. <laughs> Billy Coleman in his borrowed escort was now eighth. has had a dramatic drive up the field to fourth. Desi McCartney had cured his misfire. And he and Winston Henry were just outside the top ten. 
Brendan Fagan catching him here was now lying just behind Coleman in ninth position. But other top Irish challenger, Ger Buckley, had lost nine minutes in an accident and had no front brakes. Alan Fraser was in spectacular form and he was among the stars for the first time in his rallying career. There are just two ways to take a hairpin. The right way as demonstrated by leader Jimmy McRae. And surprisingly enough, the wrong way as is about to be demonstrated by the world champion Ari Vatnan. Then we get a number of variations on the theme. KB, wide and nice. Coin, smooth and quick. McHale, rough and quick. Coleman, late and two bites. John Lyons, early and one bite. Desi McCartney, gently. Winston Henry, just plain good. John Price, not so good. Brooks, very fast and using the bank. Buckley, the master of the handbrake. Allingham, the master of the loud pedal. Kevin Doyle, just right. And Alan Fraser, just wrong. Well, somebody else had to get it wrong and he's in good company with the world champion. Stage 27, Windmill Hill takes the rally right through the village of Churchtown and Frank Fennell was well at home amongst the houses. David McCauley is now up in the top 20. And the very experienced Kevin Doyle lying second in class six. Number 66, Phil Clayton from Cheshire. KB had now gone. The Chevette had left the road and it was too badly damaged to continue. There was just one stage to Killarney and McRae's hat trick was looking more and more a possibility. However, Vatnan was really piling on the pressure. But for John Coyne, now in fifth place, the pressure was about to force him into a rare mistake. Which he manages to overcome beautifully and loses really very little time. Austin McHale's magnificent run had uh, brought him up ahead of Coyne and Toivonen, and he lay an incredible third going into Killarney. Billy Coleman, now only 10 miles from home, was really getting the escort to handle to his liking. So after two days hard driving, the circuit maestro McRae still led the field with Vatnan just one minute, three seconds behind. Austin McHale was the toast of the town. Toivon and soldiered bravely on in fourth, Coyne fifth, Russell slipped to sixth, and Mikula had dropped to tenth. The annual pilgrimage, and just listen to the worship that they give to their gods. Thank <laughs> you. 
Flames from the dragon. The Quattro's main problem now was a slipping clutch, but fistfuls of flour were keeping it going. Winston Henry was having his best circuit ever, 12th place. Alan Fraser, 13th overall, is now a star. Robin Allingham enjoying himself in the ex Roger Clark TI 7 V8. And as the crowds stay on to enjoy the late numbers at Moll's Gap, we move on to another of the classic stages of the Circuit of Ireland Sunday run, the spectacular run down the world famous Tim Healy Pass. And who better to be our guide than the leader, Jimmy McRae? Some of the ladies are obviously not too keen on the downhill sections. Marie Maloney and following her, Cal McMaster, treat Tim Healy with the greatest degree of caution. Sunday was not without its incidents. John Midgley and Gus Kearney had an unfortunate head-on collision, bringing instant retirement for both crews. McHale had also been off the road and had dropped right back. However, things in the Audi camp were improving. Team manager David Sutton wasn't even aware of just how well they were improving. You know we're, we're up to eighth place. Oh, no, we're up to, up to sixth place. Oh, oh, what can we have here, please? Oh, seven at the head of the field, McRae was keeping Vattenen at bay. Toivonen was back in third, Brooks was up to fourth, and as we heard, Mikula was now in sixth place. On Rowdy River, they waited for the man who was once again dominating the circuit of Ireland, Jimmy McRae. And the Opal was having a virtually trouble-free run. Brooks is caught out making a rare mistake. John Coyne finds his handbrake very useful. This kind of weather should really suit the four-wheel drive Audi. 
And now the dragon was spitting flames at both ends. Despite the exhaustive efforts of the Ulster Automobile Club, safety is always a problem. This sequence shows that we still have our fair share of lunatics, I'm afraid. <laughs> Somebody's catching Robin Allingham. Now this marshal's a real good one. He's helping the spectators to obscure the direction arrow. Now he's standing with his back to the oncoming car and I think he's going to end up as a matador. Sean, on the other hand, isn't content to try and commit suicide once. That didn't work. So he has another go. And finally, Mick and his pals think they can run faster than an HSR. By stage 36, Russell looked set for another Sunday run prize. McHale just had managed to hold on to sixth place after a disastrous day. And McCartney was still not in the top ten despite some spirited driving. Mike Dunyan, on the other hand, was getting a little bit disorientated. Three days gone and McRae and Vatnan still battled it out up front. Brooks, after a magnificent drive on the Sunday stages, moved up three places and Billy Coleman was now challenging John Coyne for the top Irish honours. And so to the long run home. Over 21 hours of non-stop driving and 23 stages still to go before the Tuesday lunchtime finish in Belfast. Russell Close led the Group A category in his Opel Manta. John Midgley had been an early challenger, but Ian Corkle was now only nine seconds behind Close. amongst the leaders, Brendan Fagan, who has a good Circuit of Ireland finishing record, was now seventh. Three places behind John Coyne. Clutch problems had once again dropped the Quattro down the field. McHale was also trying to make up ground. However, there were still plenty of problems. This time a belt had jumped off the oil pump, the back axle and clutch were also giving problems, and as a service crew worked to keep the car in the rally, the Dubliner looked strangely resigned to it all. On to stage 43, where the pressure was off Jimmy McRae. Vatanen had been off the road and damaged the steering. And Jimmy now had a comfortable lead. And John Coyne was now up into fourth place. Coleman had been putting a string of quick times together and looked much more polished than McHale. And here comes the world champion in trouble. The front end deranged and being caught by Winston Henry. Buckley was also very much at home in the southwest. But his challenge had come too late.
As the brave Toivonen comes through Sleevenham on, the sad news that Austin Michael has finally retired drifts back to the press room. The Cray's advantage is over four minutes, but with 15 stages still to go, a puncture could hand victory to Brooks. And Ari Vatnen had been in the wars again. Hannah's clutch problems are now quite audible. Ari has had the front suspension replaced for the second time, and he is now back in eighth position. At the supper halt in Kilkenny, the first three places were fairly spread out, but the prize for being the first Irish driver was going to be a struggle throughout the night between John Coyne and Billy Coleman. South Armagh, Easter Tuesday. McRae has survived the night and has only four stages to go to join Roger Clark as a hat-trick winner of the circuit. Russell is set for second, but Fagan, McCartney and Fraser have all dropped out. The front of John Coyne's sunbeam shows just how hard he's been trying to hold off Coleman. And the battle is still raging as Billy is only 27 seconds behind. The whistling quattro is a rare sound anywhere, but in Carrick Allen it's enough to get a man out of his bed. Agnes, there's something going on out here. They've diverted all the traffic down our wee road. For goodness sake, up on my breakfast quick, Agnes. Jesus, oh, would you look at the goose of your man? He's in a queer hurry. The customs must be after him or something. God, I think I hear them coming now. This fella would need a spoonful of my old brand to make him go if he's going to catch him on. And so to the final service halt. We haven't been pushing it through the night. You know, we've just been maintaining a, a sort of reasonable speed. It's very difficult to, to slow down completely because that's when you make a mistake. You've got to have some uh, some competitiveness about your driving. Um, so I think, you know, barring being very unlucky, we should get through the next two stages all right. Billy Coleman's pursuit of John Coyne, to put it mildly, had been a bit hot. A bit of a delay last night when the, um, the car put uh, under the navigator seat caught fire on Sally Gap, which was the longest stage and cost us about a minute in time. But apart from that, the cars run perfectly. Mm -hmm. And you managed to cope with the tiredness okay? Yeah, just about. All I can tell you, the fire didn't help because we had smoke absolutely billowing from the, the, the you know, there were flames half a foot high coming out of the floor. And um, it didn't do us much good, I can tell you. But when it comes to heroic tales, the outstanding drive of the rally has got to be the performance of the brave young Finn, Henry Toivonen. For two-thirds of the event, he drove the big opal with two broken bones in his hand in considerable pain and only able to use his left hand to steady the wheel. An amazing performance. Before the accident, he was incredible, playing with his teammate for the lead. hand is a little bit sore and, you know, it's been all, all, all the way the same. It's, it's just useless. After the accident, well, the pictures tell their own story.
Marty Smith is nearly home. I'm so disappointed after last year. The whole idea this year was to finish and to win it this year. I think that you're going to do that. Well done and we hope to see you in Belfast. Well, Rosie did in fact do just that. She won the ladies' prize. And John Price starts the role of honour. For Winston Henry, ninth overall. A tremendous achievement from a purely private entrant. Jer Buckley would be a little disappointed with his eighth position, but it's another second match on his belt. World champions don't often finish in seventh position, but it certainly wasn't for the lack of trying. So for the third year in succession, the crowds gather outside the City Hall in Belfast to cheer home the circuit's top six finishers. And for the third year running, their hero is Jimmy McRae. He and Ian Grindrod had driven an impeccable event, not putting a mark on the car and proving once again that on tarmac, Jimmy is the maestro. Maybe the four-wheel drive Quattro is sneaking away to fight another day.